I was effectively unemployed uh, when this mysterious man, Uberto, rang me up out of the blue. I'd written one full-length screenplay, and I say full-length, it was about 180 pages. I didn't even know what a screenplay was particularly. Um, I'd written a couple of short films, but I wasn't working. I was actually a documentary director when I was employed, but at that time, I was just writing away hoping someone would notice. I'd written this 180-page script I'd written called Among Giants, which was about a group of men in Yorkshire uh, who painted pylons for a living. And it was sort of a, I guess it was sort of a Western, really. And it was really about the dynamics between men. And he was very interested uh, in the fact that I was examining men and their place in society at the time. Uh, and so we had a, a chat about a much, it was a, a sort of a two or three page outline about, from what I can recall, it was about guys in a gym. Uh, and there were two or three lines about the Chippendales. And he said, this is interesting. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> I, the Chippendales had been around quite a long time by then. Uh, and were, by that stage, were touring kind of leisure centres. I mean, they were really on kind of down the tacky end of the market. And he said, no, it is. He, and I went, no, it's the Chippendales. It's really old news. Bit tacky. What, why is that interesting? And he said, in Italy, he's an Italian, he said, this would never happen. What has happened to British men that they would humiliate themselves by taking their clothes off in front of women for money? I thought, oh, that is interesting. That's a really interesting question, which had never occurred to me to ask. Um, and that's how it started. Uh, and I said, well, if we can make this film not really about stripping, but about men and unemployment and disenfranchisement, and if we can set it in Sheffield, where I've been living, then it could be amazing. Um, but let's, let's not do a stripping film, let's do a film about men. And he was completely up for that and said, absolutely, just do what, whatever you need. And the, uh, true to his word, there's not very much stripping in the film, really. There's about three and a half minutes or something. It, or the most difficult thing is keeping that balance just perfectly aligned. Um, if you go too far one way, it becomes incredibly depressing. I mean, it's a, it's a film about unemployment, impotence, custody battles, yeah, a, a guy who's lost his job and didn't tell his wife because their relationship's so bad he has to pretend he's got a job. You know, it's kind of grim. It was marketed as a feel-good movie, but actually... There's a lot of very sad stuff going on in there. And on the other hand, you, the Trojan horse of it all is that it's about stripping. So it's a, it's a funny combination. And you just, if you get that balance a little bit wrong, the film doesn't work. Doing it on stage is really interesting because every night that balance shifts. Obviously in the film, you've got forever to edit it perfectly. On stage, it does that. It seesaws between being a little bit too depressing and a little bit too kind of like a spectacle, like a kind of show. Um, which really reminds me of how complex it was in the editing process to get it feeling just right. I trained as a documentary director, and that's how I uh, approach uh, writing a script, is I go out and talk to people, listen, do the classic thing that documentary directors do, which is to say, if I gave you my camera, what would you point it at? And suddenly people, it's a really, it really engages people. And they go, oh, well, they're knocking that mill down. The big chimney's coming down. Or when I went out to India to do Slumdog, they say, gangsters. It's all about gangsters in this. That's the big problem. Um, and if you engage them and say, we, if it was your documentary, what story would you tell? Then the most incredible stories come out. And that, so that's how I approach, approach every screenplay. And also because the people on the ground will tell you much more extraordinary stories than ones I could ever make up. The story about Gerald, who leaves the house in the morning with his suit and tie and his briefcase and goes and sits in the car all day because he, he do not tell his wife he's lost his job six months ago. That's a true story. I wouldn't have dared make up something as extraordinary as that. And that's often the way. It's, it, you know, you can't make up. The, the, the detail is so extraordinary that uh, I don't think writers can ever make it up. I don't think they need to. Humour is a really, really undervalued 
artistic mode, really. I mean, it, certainly in the north of England, it's a coping strategy. It's a way of dealing with pain. You can tell a story tragically or you can laugh about it. And it's just as tragic, but you've got a room full of people laughing with you. And somehow that makes you deal with it. And that, that's certainly, I, I mean, I grew up with people who would rather tell a funny joke about themselves than sit with their head in their hands. But it's the same base emotion of despair, but they refuse to go under. And the way they refuse to go under is laughing about it. And, you know, it's the most extraordinary coping mechanism. A lot of those characters are based on people I knew. Either I'd, I worked in a machine tools cleaning shop in uh, Leeds, and some of the characters were based on people I met there. Some of them are, it, go right back to school days. When you start out writing, you tend to draw on a very close circle of people because, you, that, in a way, when you're an inexperienced writer, you sort of have to do that. So you're drawing on very, very near material, really. So, yeah, it's a very personal script to me. There's a, there's a misconception that the comedies are a hoot. You know, when you're on the set of a comedy, it's great fun to be there, everyone's having a laugh. Actually, it's terrifying for actors, I think. On a, on a serious drama, if it doesn't work at the box office, if people don't li like it so much, you know, they can admire the cinematography, they can admire the dresses, the set. There's many levels on which those things can work on, even if the film overall doesn't quite sing. But in a comedy, if it's not funny, you're dead in the water. There's nowhere to hide. And what's more, if it's a comedy that isn't funny and you stand there naked, I mean, you are in a tremendously humiliating position. If you do the big reveal and an audience all sit there go, uh-huh, I mean, <laughs> there can be not much greater humiliation than that. If they all stand up and roar with applause and go, fantastic, then you're fine. But we didn't know how they would react. None of us knew how an audience was going to react. I think it was, it was really important it was, it was set there. There's something about the deadpan delivery of those people. I, I, that's why I found when they set the musical in Buffalo in America, my heart sank. I just thought that's so wrong for the, the rhythms, the way people speak up there. It's got a very particular poetry to the way you deliver a punchline, the deadpan nature of a line, all of that, it fits exactly to Sheffield. Um, so to me, it was, it was so important that it was set there. There was the, immediately a, a demand for a sequel, which I was, I, I was very idealistic in those days. Now I'd probably go, yeah, right, let's have three. Uh, in those days, I, I thought it was totally the wrong thing to do to have a sequel. I mean, those guys were back on the dole the next day. They had a moment in the sun. They, were, they triumphed for a day. But it didn't revolutionise their lives. They, it made things a little bit better for them. And I just... I didn't... It felt very true to the place and the people. And it, everyone made it with the right intentions. And doing a sequel, you're only doing that for the accountants. It's, it's just the laws of accountancy that say, we'll clean up on Full Monty 2, and I just didn't want to do that. Um, and I, I, had no interest in, I had no interest in being part of the film industry, the movie business, I guess. So I went back to making tiny little low-budget films, um, uh, rather than doing the big Hollywood uh, LA thing and the sequels and all of that. There was a whole slew of films that came out after the Full Monty of the kind of the, the small man makes good. It, there was a sort of renaissance of, I think, you know, very insultingly to Ken Loach, they call it sort of Ken Loach light. Um, there was sort of working class comedies. There was a, but of course, you know, mine was, mine was part of a tradition that I just picked up on a tradition that had been there for, from the Wednesday play onwards, really. So it just, it, it continued the life of, of that sort of film, which is, I think, very particular to Britain, actually.